And so for our first, uh, or for our only presentation today, uh, we have George, uh, and he is a master's student at pharmacology at U of T with a general interest in biology and health. Uh, psychedelics have played a major role in his introspective and neurodevelopmental journey in early adulthood, uh, and he owes him a great debt of gratitude for their presence and for catalyzing many friendships he's formed. Uh, and so, uh, George, if you could take over for the screen share, um, we'd love to, to hear, hear your presentation. Hello, everyone. Okay, so let's go to the presentation. Can everyone see okay and hear me okay? Okay, great. So this paper came out two years ago. It's by this group by the Olson Lab at UC Davis, and it's pretty cool. It made big waves in the sort of psychedelic science community, and it's a pretty elegant experiment. Um, pretty, you know, what they did, and I'll go, go ahead, get into it, was actually pretty simple, but it was like they knew, they kind of knew what to look at, and they found some pretty convincing results. Okay, so this picture on the right is the graphical summary, which I'm going to explain throughout the paper, but throughout this presentation, but the basic conclusion that they found is that psychedelics make neurons reorganize their structures, they form more of these appendages called dendrites, they form more spines on these dendrites, which are docking sites for other neurons to connect to them, and the other big contribution that this paper made was they coined this term called psychoplastogen. Psych meaning mind, plast meaning molding, and gen just means produces. So the idea is psychedelics produce plasticity or mold the mind. Okay, so to get into the presentation and to understand the paper, I just want to introduce some basic neuroscience and how the brain works. Um, so this is a basic picture of cells, of neurons in the brain. Sorry, one second, I'm just gonna change some things for me. Okay, cool. So the brain is mainly comprised of neurons which communicate with each other by extending branches of their bodies towards one another. These projections are unidirectional and there are two main components I'd like to introduce, which are called dendrites, shown here, and axons. So each neuron has several dendrites, which are docking sites for inputs from other neurons, and one axon, which projects and extends and connects to other neurons. Um, when a neuron fires, meaning it turns on, it sends an electrical impulse down the length of its axon and communicates to the other cells it innervates or touches to by sending chemical messengers to them. So if we zoom into one of those connections, we find the connection point between two neurons, which is called a synapse. And they're excitatory and inhibitory synapses, meaning uh, excitatory synapses being ones that encourage the uh, receiving cell to fire, and inhibitory ones discourage the receiving cell to fire. And the receiving cell sort of integrates a whole bunch of signals. On average, I've heard in a neurophysiology class, each neuron is connected to a thousand other neurons or so. So it's like they're getting a ton and ton of input and integrating the excitatory and the inhibitory inputs and all of those summing together determine whether that neuron is going to fire. And then these neurons make really like coordinated circuits and it's cool stuff. So what happens here is to actually communicate with the cell that they're sending the message to, they send molecules called neurotransmitters from the what's called the presynaptic cell. It floats over and binds receptors on the surface of the postsynaptic cell. And then there's one just little thing I want to point out, which is that excitatory synapses tend to be located on spines, what are called dendritic spines, and inhibitory synapses typically touch the dendritic shaft. Finally, to zoom in a little closer on a synapse, we can see the neurotransmitters which get released from the presynaptic cell. They float over and activate some type of effect by binding to receptors in the postsynaptic cell. <laughs> 
So now that I've introduced that, there's another thing I want to talk about, which is there's sort of a central idea in biology that the chemical structure of molecules determines their function. And psychedelics are a cool way to understand this, a cool example to look at to understand this. So serotonin is one of the brain's main neurotransmitters, and it's got its structure is sort of the double ring with the nitrogen in there, and then a side chain to another nitrogen and an OH on the other side. Chemists like to group molecules by their core skeleton. So serotonin here belongs to a class of molecules called tryptamines. And tryptamines, you'll find molecules from this class in basically every organism on Earth. They're super widespread, and so it's unsurprising that we can find similar molecules to serotonin in plants and fungi, such as DMT and psilocin, which comes from mushrooms. Now, LSD belongs to a class of molecules called ergolines, which also have the same double ring with a nitrogen in it, if you look closely, and the chain extending to another nitrogen, which is presumably why it also has an activity on serotonin receptors. And finally, there are the single-ringed phenethylamines, which include our own neurotransmitters, noradrenaline and dopamine, as well as many drugs, including DOI, which is a, a, psych, a pretty potent psychedelic, and MDMA. So the big message I'm hoping to get across is that because of psychedelic drugs' structural similarity to serotonin, they sort of hijack serotonin receptors by binding to where serotonin does. But because their structures are slightly different, they evoke a different response than serotonin. And finally, the last drug that they looked at in this study that I'm going to mention at least is ketamine. And as you can see, its structure is pretty different from the other drugs that bind to serotonin receptors. And it, ketamine does indeed act on a different neurotransmitter system entirely. But as we'll see in the study, these drugs, is, these drugs effects seem to converge somewhere down the line. So basically we know that uh, psychedelics are shaped like serotonin and so they bind serotonin receptors, but what does that tell us about like whatever's going on when we're tripping? This is a huge question that takes collaboration between a lot of fields of study because there are a lot of layers in between neurochemistry and human experience. So I found that this recent paper at least adds a nice piece to the puzzle. And so without further ado, here are the main results. What they saw is that when they administered psychedelics, they administered them to the neurons of rats and they found basically they branch more. This is a, so vehicle is sort of like a science term for uh, control, meaning they didn't get a drug. And then the neurons that were administered psychedelics tended to form more branches. And I'll talk about the implications of that as we go along. So the way they analyzed this is they took the neurons from rats and grew them in dishes and basically like took them in plastic dishes, grew them in what's essentially nutrient juice, and then added psychedelics to the meat, to the, the juice that they're living in. Um, and then to analyze the effects on dendrite growth, they basically like superimposed a picture of these rings on top of it, which is called a method called Scholl analysis. By the way, this is why I said it's sort of like a simple but elegant experiment. It's like they pretty much just looked at it and counted these rings. So when they counted the number of crossings, which you can see on the y-axis here, at various distances from the center, so as you go out further along the rings, you can see the, the I mean, the study is filled with graphs like this, and I'll, I'll mostly spare them for you. but when you administer psychedelics, you can see a more branching of the dendrites at a pretty like typical distance from the center of the neuron. And then they quantified this in these graphs here as an example. So this is the shoal, what's called area under the curve. So basically, if you take this, this graph and compute like the total area underneath the line formed, which is basically the number of crossings times the distance from the center. So it's an index of total length of the dendrites in the cells. Uh, you can see that psychedelics branch out more. Well, psychedelics cause neurons to branch more than when you don't administer them. And then n max here is the maximum number of crossings at any given distance from the center.
And finally, in science, we always check our results with statistical tests, which we use to mathematically determine whether an effect we think we're seeing is due to chance or to an actual difference between groups. And if the effect we see is large and consistent enough, we call it a statistically significant result, and we give it one or multiple stars, like you can see in these graphs, with more stars, meaning stronger statistical significance. And there's sort of a general rule in science that your results have to be statistically significant if you want to use them as evidence supporting a conclusion. Okay, so now that we've established the methods they used, I'll mostly spare you the graphs for the rest of the paper and just tell you the results. And you can always double check in the paper, but hopefully you trust me enough and you can take my word for it. So in these first experiments, they found that psychedelics make dendrites grow, but these were neurons that were grown in a dish, and that's a lot different from neurons in a whole organism. So next they wanted to ask, how do we know that this would work in living beings? So in the name of science, they dosed fruit flies at different developmental stages called instars, and found the same effect, more branching in the neurons of rats that were given LSD or DOI. And this is pretty cool because in addition to corro uh, corroborating the evidence from petri dish experiments, this suggests psychedelics might be acting through an evolutionarily conserved mechanism that goes back to mammals and insects closest common ancestor from about 700 million years ago. So next what they did is they stained the neurons with fluorescent pigments that bind for structural proteins so that they could take a closer look at what's going on in the neurons docking sites, their dendrites. They found that psychedelics also increase the number of spines shown here that allow excitatory neurons to connect to them. With some more staining procedures, they found that psychedelics increased excitatory synapse formation as well. So this time they stained for two markers of excitatory signaling, one of which shows up on presynaptic neurons in green, and one of which, which shows up on postsynaptic neurons in purple. So with that, they knew that when the two stains showed up in the same place, it meant that two neurons were connecting to form an excitatory synapse. And they found, I mean, they didn't quantify it in these pictures, but they did it in the graphs later, that when you administer psychedelics to neurons in Petri dishes, they form more excitatory synapses to each other. So to tie this together with previous results, not only was there development of the neurons dendrites and dendritic spines, but those spines were also receiving more inputs from other neurons. And that's all well and good, but does it actually mean that the neurons are changing their behavior? Like, are, what if these structural changes in the neurons don't lead to any functional difference in how the brain's behaving? So they, they checked that out by giving rats DMT, and then 24 hours later, measuring the electrical signal in neurons from their prefrontal cortex. So the traces show the raw data of the neurons firing. These are three examples of neurons that, of a rat that wasn't given a drug, and three examples of neurons from a rat that was given DMT. And as you can kind of tell, it looks like there's more frequent firing from the DMT administered rats. When they quantified this with a whole bunch of neurons from each group, they found that the frequency and the amplitude of these electrical spikes are increased after the rats were given DMT. So what this means is that the neurons of rats exposed to DMT were primed to fire more frequently and more intensely than under normal conditions. In neuroscience, we call these neurons more excitable, meaning that they fire more readily. And this is consistent with the previous finding that psychedelics stimulate the production of excitatory synapse, synapses. With more excitatory input, the neurons fire more readily 24 hours later. Okay, so they kind of... Ketamine's uh, antidepressant activity has kind of been mapped out in the brain and they already knew what I just mentioned happens with psychedelics. They already knew that that happened with ketamine. There's, there had already been research in that. So we know now that despite affecting completely different neurotransmitter systems, ketamine and the serotonin signaling psychedelics produce the same output on neuronal growth and plasticity. So they reason that the signals might be converging somewhere, maybe on some signaling pathway inside the cell. They knew that ketamine's antidepressant effect was mediated through this uh, brain signaling molecule called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. So they went ahead with this target first. They knew that BDNF signaling increases dendrite development, and they took 
So as you can see in these traces, they first tried administering BDNF and they showed increased uh, dendrite formation in these neurons. Then uh, when they administered DOI, they found the same increase. And then when they tried administering DOI and BDNF together, they didn't find any increase, any further increase in dendrite formation. So it's basically one of two things is happening. Either the neurons were sort of maxed out in how much branching they could do, and adding extra molecules wasn't going to do any more, or DOI and BDNF were acting somehow redundantly, and they were like converging onto the same signaling system. So the next target they went after, oh, I missed one thing. If they blocked BDNF activity with uh, another drug, that prevented psychedelic-induced dendrite development. So if they administered, say, DOI with the BDNF blocker, you got what looks like the vehicle trace where there's no increase in dendrite formation. So that, with that experiment, they determined that BDNF signaling is necessary for psychedelics effects on neuron growth. So next they targeted my favorite intracellular signaling system, mTOR, which is called the mammalian target of rapamycin, named for the drug that inactivates it. So mTOR is a protein that sits inside every one of our cells and integrates a bunch of signals from the surrounding environment, including nutrients, oxygen, and energy levels. It's essentially a master regulator of cell metabolism. If it senses there's an abundance of energy at the cell's disposal, it'll activate and promote cell growth. Whereas if energy is scarce, it'll shut down a whole slew of cell processes to help the cell survive. They targeted the system because they knew that BDNF signaling leads to mTOR activation. So they knew, they decided to check whether psychedelics target this system as well. So here again, they found that the mTOR pathway is necessary for psychedelics to promote dendrite growth and branching. When they co-administered rapamycin, which shuts down mTOR, they found that psychedelics don't promote growth anymore, as you can tell by the stars in these graphs. So if you look like DMT, LSD, DOI, you get more branching as measured by a fold change in the area under curve, so like the total branching of neurons. And if you administered rapamycin with these drugs, you basically eliminated the increase. And same thing for the maximum amount of branching. And what do you know? If you block 5-HT2A receptors, you get the same loss of effect. So 5-HT, just by the way, is a chemical name for serotonin. And 5-HT2A has sort of been the like star receptor of psychedelics. Like this is where research up to now has sort of pinpointed that psychedelics is sort of key effects are on the 5-HT2A receptor. So when they used a drug to block 5-HT2A receptors specifically and administered psychedelics to the cells, again, no dendrite growth. So pretty cool paper. They found that psychedelics stimulate what they call both, uh, what's the word, structural and functional plasticity. So the structural plasticity is in changes to the structure, the shape of neurons. So more dendrite growth, more dendritic spine formation, increased, oh, more connections between the neurons. So more synapses formed. And also functional plasticity, which is a change in the way the neurons are behaving. So the, that was in the DMT experiments with all of like the, the traces where they found increased excitability of the neurons. And then they also mapped out the intracellular pathways that are key to this activity, which are BDNF signaling, mTOR, and 5-HT2A serotonin receptors. So I just want to discuss a few caveats to, th to this experiment that are important to keep in mind because so far, basically what I've been saying is like, these results are awesome, psychedelics are super cool, and this sounds great, but there are a few things that we have to keep in mind. So for one, these experiments were done in rats and rodents are like remarkably similar to humans in so many ways, especially at the cell level, which is what we were dealing with in this study. But especially with the brain, humans are remarkably different. Humans are especially different in our brains than rats. And 
you never know if it's going to ex if the findings that you find in rats are going to extrapolate to humans. Another big caveat is they took neurons from embryonic rats. They took rats that were like about to be born. They took their neurons and grew them in dishes. And the reason they did this is these neurons from fetal rats are much more young and much more capable of surviving the stress of being taken out of a rat brain and put into a dish. That's a stressful experience for cells. A lot often they die and they die a lot more often if you were to take neurons out of an adult brain. So that's why they did the study, it's, it's just easier. But these neurons being younger and being a part of a younger organism, um, we know that neurogenesis and neuroplasticity decreases with age. And so these neurons were probably much more capable of growth and much more capable of responding to psychedelics than neurons from an adult brain. So also we don't know exactly whether these results can be extrapolated to adults. Then there's the whole thing of a heterogeneous cell population. This isn't that much of a critique of the study. So basically they, they didn't differentiate between any subtypes of neurons and neuroscientists are like finding new subtypes of neurons every couple of years. There's like a billion of them, it's overwhelming. But for this paper, they just sort of loped neurons into one category and different, didn't look at any differences between them. And so if they were to, have looked at more specific subtypes of neurons, maybe they would have found differential effects based on the neuron subtype. Finally, there was this bit of suspicious use of different psychedelics for different experiments. Like in the fruit flies, they administered LSD and DOI, but then in the electrophysiology experiments, the ones where they measured the electrical activity in neurons, they injected DMT into the rats, but then all the other experiments, they used like all the drugs that were shown in the, in the graphs before. And I don't know what's going on, but there is this thing in science called publication bias, which is the tendency of positive results to be published over negative results. So it, I don't want to come off as accusing them, but it's, it was just a bit weird. Anyway, nevertheless, experiments cool and there was some solid evidence of neuroplasticity and as a proof of concept study this was pretty strong so what's the deal with plasticity to finish off i just want to explain this so plasticity is sort of a catch-all term for the brain's ability to change we need plasticity to form new memories we need it to learn things without plasticity we couldn't adapt to anything new we would just stay the same and plasticity is especially relevant with stress, which is a risk factor for mood disorders such as depression, bipolar disorder, as well as, of course, PTSD. So stress shuts down the activity of growth factors such as BDNF in the brain, which then causes neurons in key brain regions to atrophy, exactly the opposite, exactly in the opposite way of how we saw in this paper upon psychedelic administration. So a lot of these ideas were developed by a recently deceased researcher named Ronald Duman, who developed this hypothesis of stress's impact on growth factor signaling in the brain, as well as mapping how antidepressants and ketamine affect plasticity. And I found this quote of his in a recent review paper on plasticity and depression. Further transgenerational epigenetic transmission may help to prepare newborns to cope in specific ways with adverse environments to which the parent had been exposed. As is the case with many stress-related disorders, such as PTSD, the long-standing epigenetic adaptations to extremes become dysfunctional when the organism returns to a more congenial environment. And I think this quote really is, illustrates really well a fascinating concept in biology that's only gained acceptance in the last 20 years or so which is that the events of our lives influence the biology of our children, and that we may transmit adaptations to our own trauma that protect them from serious danger, but in the absence of that danger, those adaptations hinder their ability to flourish. There's well-established research that our stress physiological system can be ramped up or down depending on life experience, and that changes to this system can be passed on to children epigenetically. So the big take home I'm trying to get at is that many of us may be harming ourselves with unconscious self-defense mechanisms that we derived from our own experiences or even that we inherited from our parents. 
because plasticity is how the brain changes and it's something that the most unwell people are missing, it may be a key player in our ability to heal. And that's the talk. I'd like to thank all the people who helped me out somehow along the way, including the organizers of MAPS. Awesome, thank you so much for an amazing presentation, George. Uh, so we'll get into questions now. As usual, if you guys have questions, just pop it in the chat. Uh, we have lots of time for questions today, which is awesome. Uh, so the first one here is from Carrie, and they say, uh, what might be the implication of these findings for cognitive illnesses like dementia? Do you have any insights or speculation? Uh, dementia is complicated. It's, uh, I don't really feel like an expert in any way on dementia, I'm, I'm afraid. Maybe somebody in the audience could answer that. Yeah, definitely. People are always uh, welcome to pop stuff in the chat. Uh, if they do have any insight for sure. Uh, we'll move on to the next one for now. Erin um, Kumar says, are there any studies being done uh, on the adult population after this paper uh, came out by any chance? Do you know of any studies kind of looking at that? Well, I wrote David Olson, who's the last author on this paper, and I, I asked him why like, they did this, these experiments in the neurons from embryos, and he said that he basically said what I explained, that it's harder to get live neurons from the brains of adult rats, but that they did sort of double check that it works out by administering psychedelics to adult rats. And then when they checked their neurons afterwards, um, they found increased dendritic branching and synaptogenesis and the stuff that we talked about in the study. Cool, very cool. The next one is from Ron. Um, so he goes, how does the notion that psychedelics support structural and functional neuroplasticity mesh with the evidence that psychedelics cause broadband cortical desynchronization and reduced electrical activity slash blood oxygen levels in certain regions of the brain? I can reread that again if you'd like. Okay, I'm, I'm reading it now. That's a, also a really tough question. And yeah, I haven't seen any research sort of reconciling those two points of view. I guess the one I pointed out, the one I've been talking about is sort of like a cell biology perspective, whereas the other one is um, sort of a neuroimaging based perspective, but it, it's tough to reconcile. And I don't know, I'm definitely not able to right now. I did write Robin Carhart Harris once like a year ago, asking him a question like this. And he basically said like uh yes there is there this can be reconciled but like uh keep in track keep in touch or like keep like looking out for our future publications wink wink oh interesting we'll have to keep an eye on that um next one uh, not really like a question but just like a cool comment um just from kevin here and when you're talking about the limitation um of only using like some drugs for some animals and he was just suggesting that it could be that they don't have the right paperwork or permit uh to use all three drugs in all the experiments which definitely yeah can be true especially with uh getting all the right permits uh also money to <laughs> funding drugs are expensive so sometimes i'm sure that that could also come into play as well um next question here um, from michael uh, do any of the experiments uh within this study address how long the plasticity lasts after the drug administration not that i've seen and that's a good question that uh the maps organizers warned me about that people would be wondering these changes are all reversible, and that's sort of what happens in uh, response to stress is that neurons retract their dendrites and uh, sort of degrade synapses and lose excitability in a lot of cases in certain brain regions. So it's tough to say, like, they, at least as far as I know, the Olsen lab hasn't looked at how long lasting the effects are. But that's definitely, definitely worth it. Yeah, I think that is an age old question. A lot of uh, research right now is how long does it last? Um, next question from Caitlin um, Do you know uh, what doses were used in the experiment? Mm -hmm. So, uh, the in vitro studies where they had neurons in dishes, they 
administered doses of 10 micromolar, but 90 micromolar for DMT, 10 micromolar for all the other psychedelics. And then the in vivo studies where they injected them into rats, they administered 10 milligrams per kilogram. But those, the in vivo studies, they only did, for the rats, they only did uh, DMT and ketamine. And off the top of the he your head, uh, you may not know this. Do you know if those uh, doses are like standard to other studies that you've seen? Do you think they're kind of in a similar range? It seemed pretty high, but uh, there are species differences. Okay, well, for example, DMT, the dose they gave to rats was like 10 milligrams per kilogram. And say in me, who's like, 80 kilograms, that would be 800 milligrams, which is insane. But there are species differences in uh, responsiveness to psychedelics, and apparently you have to give rats a lot more. Um, as far as other studies, I'm not sure. David Olson, in the email correspondence I had with him, said that 10 micromolar was sort of like a standard amount that they give for the, the in vitro stuff. Awesome, thanks. Uh, next question here from Michael. Uh, he goes, um, how, is a cr uh, how is crossing defined in the shoal analysis? Um, is a crossing of the, uh, of the ring, um, sorry, is a crossing of the ring or the neuron branches crossing each other? Yeah, can you just explain like the crossing for the shoal analysis? Yeah, I'll just, uh, one sec, I'll go back to the presentation. Just while you get there, as a little side note here, we're talking about dosing. Ryan just chimed in saying that for ketamine, for example, is a 0 0.5 milligram per kilogram uh, in humans for depression. So just very interesting looking at the differences uh, in the ratio for dosing. Okay, can you all see the uh, Scholl analysis here? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so the crossings are whenever any part of the neuron crosses one of these rings. So say if we were to go out, out this far out, it'd be like, here's one crossing, here's another crossing, one, two, boom, boom, crossing. That's how they counted them. So the number of crossings here corresponds to how many times the neuron crosses the ring. Does that answer your question? Yep, he's got it. Uh, next question here. Uh, did the researchers categorize the types of enhanced connections the drugs caused? So, for example, was there uh, primarily increased branching within brain regions, or to what extent did uh, branching extend beyond a certain region? Oh, well, in this experiment, they actually they just took cortical neurons as like a whole category. So, cortex in anatomy is like an anatomical term for just like the outside. So it's basically like all of this they took from rats. They didn't really differentiate between regions aside from that. Perfect. Um, do you, uh, this is from Brian. Uh, do you believe psychedelics play a role in epigenetics at all? Uh, also, how soon do you see ketamine being prescribed or used as a regular antidepressant? Hmm. Okay. The, the epigenetics question is interesting. It's tough to say. I haven't heard of any studies addressing psychedelics affecting epigenetic marks. Um, like this study, for example, wasn't really looking at it at all or on gene expression in general. But that would be an interesting mechanism to see. If, it, if true, it would definitely be a lot more potentially long lasting than the type of stuff we've seen in this experiment. And the second question was, how, how long do you think it'll be until we see ketamine? Yeah, how soon out? until, yeah. That's as a tough. regular, used as a regular antidepressant. <laughs> yeah, that's tough to say. Um, I'm not, I haven't followed ketamine too much personally. I did hear of like insane prices it was being sold for in the US. And I also think there are barriers to it being rolled out en masse. Um, that are sort of and and it is available for um, prescription right now, right? And Ryan is also just time uh, chiming in here saying it is already approved. But I guess the difference is it's not really your typical uh, antidepressant that often people would would go to. Um, do you? I guess do you think that it has the potential, in your opinion, 
to kind of become like a regular one or is it still do you think it's going to be kind of um more of an extreme or unusual not unusual choice but less common choice um in your opinion it would be cool i mean depression is such a complicated illness and i think that treatments have to be really personalized compared to say you know more classical illnesses like heart disease or cancer but so maybe for a certain subset of the population ketamine could be like really great Mm. I don't know. It's tough for me to say I, I don't follow ketamine too closely. Mm -hmm. It's a hard one. And also then, of course, uh, just public opinion and, and physician preference and stuff comes into that too as well, right? So it's a whole part of the psychedelic revolution and reform. Uh, Sarah here has a question. Um, are there other situations that cause neuroplasticity uh, and increases in branching that you're aware of? Uh, if so, how does the magnitude of the increases compare to that of psychedelics uh, and what might happen in non-pharmacological situations? Yeah, I can't speak to the amount of neuroplasticity or branching that gets induced, but exercise has been shown to increase BDN BDNF signaling in the brain and to promote neuroplasticity. Awesome. Very cool. Um, Michael asks, were any analysis done comparing the relative plasticity effects among their serotonergic agents? Um, would it be reasonable to expect that the more potent compound like DOI uh, had a more significant effect? Hmm. Well, here, I'll, I'll actually bring up the SUPS, the, the supplementary materials from the paper, because they had an interesting figure right here, which is the dose responses of the different drugs. And if you look at, say, DOI, so on the y-axis here, they have the percentage efficacy, which I believe is being compared to the max from ketamine. And then on the x-axis, they have the increasing concentrations of the drugs administered. And if you look at DOI, this is a measure of potency, and the lower EC50, a lower EC50 means higher potency. And it had like, it blows the other drugs out of the water for potency, but it doesn't even get to 100% efficacy. It doesn't even, it only gets up to like 50% of the max effect of ketamine. So you get a lot more bang for your buck if you're getting like a low, if you're going for a low effect, but you're not going to get the full effects with DOI. Does that answer okay. your question? Some sort of uh, biased agonism, Michael's wondering. Mm -hmm. With uh, DOI, you mean? Yeah, I think, I believe so. Mm -hmm. That's tough. I am not too well versed on intracellular signaling from psychedelics. Um. <laughs> no worries at all. All right, you have answered a million questions for us. We're just gonna do one more uh, to wrap it up here. Um, thank you so much. Um, so this last one's from Kate, uh, and it says, what related research would you like to see come next? Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that too much. Related research? Um, I mean, back on the point of the question about reconciling it with imaging data, like neuroimaging data, it would be really cool to see some type of I don't know, some type of thing that could reconcile the two. It, it's really tough because they're, they're like such different scales that you're working with. But yeah, that's my, that's my answer off the top of my head. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, George. And you had an extra long uh, question and um, answer period. So we appreciate you doing that for us. Uh, really awesome presentation. And I'm going to pass it over to Leo now to wrap things up.